I want to refresh your memory of what we have already discussed. In short summary, the foundations of the methodologies of the devil are rooted in three things. The world, the flesh, and the devil. There are three baits used by the entrapping power of Satan. The world is the construct of the methodologies, and its appeal to the human being is through the flesh. There are these systems called the cosmos that are called the world. We are told not to love the world, which is not humanity, it is not the people. The world is a construct of systems that appeal to something in a person, something in you. You could have every kind of system, but if it has no appeal to you, then it does not matter that it exists as far as you are concerned. In fact, part of the overcoming of the devil is to release oneself from any measure of reliance upon the world. You may use it, but never rely on it. Use the world, but do not depend on it. Do not rely on it because it is constructed as an alternative to God. These systems have an appeal to you personally on the basis of the flesh. The term flesh is a reference to the physical body and also to a mindset. A mindset is mentioned earlier that is rooted in three lusts. The lust of the flesh, protection. The lust of the eyes, provision, and the pride of life, self. A lust is not a particular action. A lust is a condition of the mind. It is a condition that predisposes you to choosing wrongly. It influences your choice. The reason it is called a lust is because you will give in to it, no matter what the cost to you. The truth is, in most instances, people do not even think of the cost to themselves. Lust is that powerful. Lust is that blinding. Lust is all-encompassing. Lust so dominates choice that people who otherwise are wise are rendered foolish, foolish beyond measure in the areas of their lust. We see it all the time. We see hugely successful businessmen being exposed in stings with prostitutes. It happens all the time, and it makes the news when it does. And people say, why are these highly sophisticated, highly successful businessmen and women caught up in these acts? Because they lust sexually and they are willing to risk family, career, businesses, and reputation to fulfill their lust. It doesn't make sense. Don't try to make sense out of a lust. It is the way the soul works when it makes decisions based upon emotions. And Satan, in his wiles, has created these systems to entrap you to draw you out of any area of strength that you may have, to cast you down into the pit of your weakness. In submitting to your fleshly weaknesses, you will always be seen as your worst self. That is what lusts do. We see politicians and public figures routinely saying stupid things and then having to say, I'm not like that in real life. How many disgraced politicians or disgraced stars say stupid things that even an ordinary person, an unsophisticated, unsuccessful person would know not to say? And yet it comes out of them. Why? Because it is a reflection of a lust. A lust will move you before you exercise good sense or good judgment. You take action before you count the cost. That is what lusts do. That is why they are called lusts. Sexual lust 
is a form of lust, but it is not the only way that a lust is manifested. People will boast about what they have accomplished. Why? Because they lust for recognition. They desire to emerge out of obscurity, and they will cast aside all social norms and boast about their accomplishments only to be dubbed as foolish. We have watched everyone from princes and kings to vagabonds be named, indicted, and charged, and in many incidences, convicted of all kinds of lustful things. After all, it is what feeds the headlines today, isn't it? It used to be that the National Enquirer was viewed as a pretentious newspaper rag that pretended to be a newspaper. Now, National Enquirer stories are mainstream stories as we read about a parade of fools who are entrapped by their lusts. This is how powerful the fuel of lust is in luring you into the systems of the cosmos, of the world. Standing against these schemes requires at a minimum an understanding of what these schemes are and how they work. I want to read something to you that is a segue into how the power of God is deployed in terms of the armor of God. It shows how the armor of God is successful against these nefarious, deeply embedded and terribly appealing schemes of the devil that focus on the lust of the flesh. Paul in 2 Corinthians 10 verse 2 says the following, But I beg you that when I am present, I may not be be bold with that confidence by which I intend to be bold against some who think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. This is a hugely important distinction. Though we walk around in the flesh, when it comes time to engage the devil in his schemes, we are not going to be found in the flesh. Why? Because all of his systems, all of his methodologies depend upon the allure and the pull of the lusts of the flesh. They will trap you. Paul says when it comes to dealing with the devil, although we walk around clothed by flesh, we are to change our mindsets. We are not to be fleshly when we deal with the devil. We do not war according to the flesh. Why? For the weapons of our warfare. Dot, dot, dot. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 4. That is what the armor of God is. It is the weapons of our warfare. Every piece of the armor of God is an effective weapon against the devil's schemes. In fact... When we go back to Ephesians 6, Paul begins to tell us that when clothed with the armor of God, we will be able to withstand against the devil's schemes. Now, withstand is a synonym of the word Nikea, or the word Nike as we've anglicized it, and it means victorious one. There is a time when we ought to stand, and in standing, we are to stand against. The fashion of our standing is to stand against as one who is victorious over the devil's schemes. Looking back, Paul says in defining the weapons in our, of our warfare, which are the armor of God, that each piece of armor is a weapon to withstand or to stand against. The armor of God is a weapon, and it is a weapon to withstand. No aspect of the armor of God is benign. The armor of God is not designed solely for defensive action. It is weaponry to stand successfully against one, as one who is an overcomer. Paul says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. 
bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 4 through 5. Now, we have thought, or have been taught, that taking every thought captive is whenever a thought comes into your mind, you wrestle with it, and you make sure it does not get any root in you. Well, that's true, but that is a Sunday school understanding. In reality, it means that you measure and judge everything that is said in your sphere of influence by the knowledge of God all the time. And not just in you, but whatever anybody says at any time that does not align with the soundness of truth. You are called to judge it and to take it captive. In other words, you are to give it no place. This is not defensive. Whether you verbalize it or you acknowledge it internally, it is literally to say, this is not the truth. The truth is different. This is deception. This is the fashion in which Jesus engaged Satan in the wilderness when he was challenged by the devil. Everything that Satan put forth, Jesus arrested it with the truth. He said, it is written. When Satan said, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. But Jesus answered and said, it is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's Matthew 4, verse 3 and 4. Jesus had quoted the Old Testament. He quoted what Moses said God had told him. The reason that he led Israel through the wilderness. That you might know that man does not live on bread alone. Jesus states the complete truth and exercises the rule of the representational posture of a son of God. One of the names of God, Elohim, capital E, is the word for majesty. And the derivative term, magist magistrate, literally. And then we find it in the 82nd Psalm. There it says... I say that you are Elohim, little e, you are gods. Once again, notice that Elohim is not capitalized. Foolish, uneducated men have misinterpreted that by saying, we are gods, period. Yes, we are. But in the sense of being the magistrates of God, the Elohim of God. The role of a magistrate is to judge. When we judge, we are clothed in the majesty of God. But these uneducated men neither know God nor did they know the truth. They just wanted to be, wanted to be clothed with, we are gods. No, we are magistrates. We are the Elohim of God. We take every thought captive. We arrest it and we judge it. Every thought that comes against the knowledge of God by an appeal to the lust of the flesh, we judge it. We judge it whether it comes up within ourselves or we judge it when it comes up within our sphere of influence spoken by others. We may articulate or speak out our judgment, or we may be quiet about it. Nevertheless, we judge it because we are rulers and magistrates, the Elohim of God. We are the sons of God, and as such, we participate in the divine function of the Elohim to judge all things according to the standard represented in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. These weapons work. They overthrow the devil. The devil has no insight or entrance into our domains. But we have not been taught these things, have we? Because the majority of the church leaders and the church of man's traditions 
have been too busy getting their hands in our pockets as their primary goal and leveraging, leveraging themselves by standing on our backs to their own greatness. That is what God is overthrowing. Do not weep when harlotry is overthrown and removed from among the people of God. Do not weep. It is the time of judgment. For it is God who is judging, and he is judging the folly of the unfaithful, the deceitful, and the false. Time has come when judgment must begin within the house of God, and it has. And it will continue until every vile and contemptible root has been rooted out, cast down, exposed, and debunked, because God desires a people clothed in the splendor and radiance of his person. Looking back at 2 Corinthians 10, casting down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. That's 2 Corinthians 10, verses 5 and 6. In other words, you are ruling. You are the Elohim of God. You are his magistrates. Your identity allows you access to the weaponry of your warfare. Your identity and relationship allow you the legitimacy and gives you the authority for bringing out divine standards to judge seductive thoughts to judge thoughts that would seduce you from the loyalty and duty to Jesus. Just imagine if you would apply this standard. My goodness. But both the church and the leadership have been soundly asleep, walking in the fire of their lusts, and God is overthrowing them and separating them from what truly belongs to him. Paul said, do you look at things according to the outward appearance? If anyone is convinced in himself that he is Christ, let him again consider this in himself, that just as he is Christ, even so we are Christ. For even if I should boast somewhat more about our authority, which the Lord gave us for edification and not for your destruction, I shall not be ashamed, lest I seem to terrify you by letters. For his letters, they say, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. That's 2 Corinthians 10, verses 7 through 10. Paul is telling us that we are to judge things in the way that Jesus does. Paul says, we are not judging things by outward appearances, not by what they appear to be. We are judging things by the eternal standard of the truth. And he will define that with greater focus when he talks about take to yourselves the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Ephesians 6.17. It is how you functionally deconstruct the deceptive weaponry of the enemy intending to appeal to the lusts and to take you captive. Here is why we are called to judge in the same manner of Jesus as the Elohim of God. In Isaiah 11, speaking of Jesus, it says, And a branch shall grow out of his roots. And here it's speaking prophetically of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Isaiah 11. 11, 1 and 2. This is a key understanding because the Spirit of the Lord, Holy Spirit, animates the spirit of sonship in you. You are born of the Spirit. You are a carrier of His grace and a carrier of His life, which is entirely carried in the Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord, Holy Spirit, is upon Jesus. Therefore, when you are like Jesus, this is what happens to you. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest on you. Holy Spirit will indwell you. 
the spirit of wisdom and understanding is Holy Spirit. The spirit of counsel and might is Holy Spirit. The spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord is Holy Spirit who dwells in you. All of that is in Isaiah 11 verse 2. And because of that investiture as the Son, the same Spirit, Holy Spirit, that is in the Lord Jesus Christ is in us. Isaiah 11 verses 3 and 5 says, And shall make him of quick understanding, and his delight shall be in the reverential and obedient fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, neither decide by the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness and justice shall he judge the poor and decide with fairness for the meek, the poor, and the downtrodden of the earth. And he shall smite the earth and the oppressor with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips. He shall slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his waist, and faithfulness the girdle of his loins. As the Elohim of God, as his magistrates, we are not to judge by what our flesh thinks. In the spirit, we are not subject to the lusts of the flesh. Our flesh is not to be the basis of our judgment. We are not to judge by the sight of our eyes, nor decide by the hearing of our ears. But with righteousness, we are to judge the poor and decide the equity. Decide with equity for the meek of the earth. Now, guess what the first item of the armor of God is? Ephesians 6.14 tells us, Stand therefore having girdled your waist with truth. This is how we are to employ the might and the power of God that is vested in the Lord Jesus, who was given all of it in heaven and in earth for our benefit. We will soon look at how each piece of the armor works. We have spent quite a bit of time talking about the warfare. For some reason, it never occurs to people that we ought to look at what the warfare is and understand the enemy's tactics before we suit up. If you don't know what you're getting dressed for, chances are you will not be dressed properly for the occasion.